So in this session, uh, um, Mark will focus on the Zero Trust core principles developed by the Zero Trust Architecture Project Workgroup in the Open Group Security Forum that we've been hearing, um, hearing about. So a warm welcome from the Open Group, please, for Mark Simos. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. So um, thank you very much. This is uh, it's an honor to be here amongst some of the original Jericho Forum folks and, uh, and great colleagues that uh, I've been working with in the Open Group. So I'm going to be sharing uh, information um, about the core principles themselves, specifically discussing them. Um, just as a quick recap for those that uh, may have missed uh, Nikhil's uh, excellent session, you know, the world has really uh, become much more complicated, um, very much recognized by the Jericho Forum and all those efforts there, um, but even more intensely today with, uh, with APIs and the ability to generate it. Um, there's sort of this uh, interesting dynamic that if it is not that costly or difficult to add another instance of something, you're going to find it sprawling. And we see that with documents, with files, with USB sticks and SharePoint sites. And now we're seeing it with apps and APIs as well. And so um, the world is at a scale now of, you know, these sort of uh, virtual electronic entities that have to be secured on um, that are, you know, each important to the business in their own way, you know, that, um, it's, it's a really, really challenging world, um, especially given the role changes and all the other things, uh, as Nikhil mentioned earlier. Um, of course, remote work is now normal, so um, blasted what was left of the confidence that we could um, keep ourselves secure under a perimeter. Um, uh, those partnerships, competitors, the communication patterns, and national interests and regulations are also changing very quickly, um, which are challenging uh, businesses as well. And this, uh, and this leads to, you know, when you take a look at it through the, the lens of, you know, how do we modernize security, which is in many ways, you know, kind of a, 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 a kind of definition of zero trust, you know, is all the things that we know we needed to modernize for a number of years that have all come together and now being organized. Um, you need things like automated policy enforcement, so you don't have to worry about manually applying things when stuff changes because it's always changing. Adaptive identity management that can handle these role changes of the, uh, as Nikhil mentioned, a person that becomes a, um, uh, a vendor and then a supplier and then a contributor and then a competitor in a matter of um, a short period of time. And then of course, you know, the way I like to think about zero trust that helps bring me a lot of clarity to it is we're not trying to pull the users and the, and the assets into the realm of IT and security and secure it the way we want. We're actually going and taking the security to the users and the assets and meeting them where they are. Um, and those, you know, those are uh, users, those are that's the data, that's the applications that matter to the business and, um, and the end users and the customers. And so it helps to better focus security resources and better monitor when you're living in that space as opposed to artificially trying to pull them into the IT and security paradigms of times past. So how do you actually manage this? You know, again, a very similar to the deals diagram, you have to have a consistent policy that applies across it and great threat intelligence whether and, and applies it to the data directly, the apps and the APIs accessing it. And so you end up with this sort of, you know, two different kinds of preventive controls. One is sort of the expected sets of access, and then the other is the sort of unexpected types of ways that it could possibly be used. You know, whether you're bringing security up to meet the data or the data value down to meet the, uh, the efficient, scalable way that you can provide security across all this. And then, of course, um, the visibility sandwich of the immediate moment by moment stuff that's happening um, in terms of the attack space and, and proactive threat hunting, et cetera, of the attackers, and then the ongoing sort of longer term governance and continuous improvement. Again, both consuming real time data, et cetera, but with uh, different uh, objectives. One is to get rid of immediate threats and risks, and the other is to be continuously lowering the risk level of the organization and sustaining the gains that we make. So that then leads us to the principles themselves. Um, we, we broke these down into about five different categories. Um, the first two are organizational value and organizational risk. Uh, the next one is governance. Um, and then the last two are the technology and then the security controls. And so I'll be covering uh, each of those in a little bit of depth. And then talking a little bit about the, uh, the how we map to the Jericho Forum. Um, and Steve did an amazing job of kind of describing some of the history I've learned a bunch in the last session. 
Um, and so I you know, wouldn't be able to do it nearly as much justice as he could, but I'll uh, give a quick overview of kind of how those things map. So the first one, an organizational value, you know, it's nice that the text is actually a little bit bigger because there's only one. This is extremely important. And this is the, this is the business driver for zero trust in my mind, which is that, you know, in order for security to enable the business and act to actually enable the business, which is getting out of the way so that users and devices can do what they do naturally and work where they need to work in a place where, you know, the end users feel creative and they're able to meet with the business partners and they're able to meet with customers and they're able to do business without being fettered by all the security pain and inconvenience. And so really working in any network in any location with the same security assurances is the goal. Obviously, you have to take into context that this person just randomly drop into a country that um, they've never been to before. All those things need to be taken into consideration. But the answer is not no, because you're not on the corporate network or you're not deep in it. So organizational risk is very much about aligning to the organization. Um, so making sure that all of the security efforts and elements that are being done or being done in the context and in, in the frameworks, in the mechanisms, the processes, et cetera, of the organization itself. Now, sometimes organizations have a mature risk model and framework, you know, something based on FAIR or, or, or another framework. Um, sometimes they don't. So you, you have to kind of apply these um, as it makes sense and as you're able to. Um, but ultimately, you've got to align and support at a minimum, the organizational goals and the risk launch and threshold, even if that's not formally defined, you know, in terms of dollars or specific numbers, um, the security goals and the security itself has to align to what the organization is trying to accomplish as a business, as a mission, um, you know, nonprofits, governments, et cetera. Um, and they have to be able to align to that risk tolerance and threshold. So that is um, very, very important. And then the second piece is really in support of that. If the organization does have that risk framework um, to be using that, to be fitting the security within there so that the things that these business leaders have gotten used to, they're familiar with, they, they adapt to on a daily basis and it's you know, part of their decision process and their conversation or the lingua franca, that is what security should fit in. Security should not be operating outside of it. Yes, security has some challenges with defining things. There is really a massive step in the right direction for aligning that. Um, but it's very difficult sometimes to get data on security because you're dealing with a human variable um, uh, that on the other end, the attacker and you know, what it costs them to attack and what they gain from it. Um, so security is a little bit tricky to integrate in there, but it is well worth the effort to go ahead and put that in there. Um, so you can get that in there. Uh, number four there, um, you've got to look at it over the course of a lifetime. So when you look at the organizational risk, you've got to look at the data and consider what it could be during its entire lifetime for the transaction. Make sure it's not just a point in time, but it's actually covering the entire thing and all the, the players in it. And then the relationship, if there's a business relationship between two organizations, the risk of those kind of transfer of data and whether or not we provide the files and sort of encrypted phone home uh, for the key kind of way, um, you need to be looking at it through the entire life cycle of the data the relationship, the transaction, so that you're not just saying, well, we have TLS over the session, but it's unencrypted under your end. Um, or yeah, the, the data is encrypted while it's on our devices, but then it got emailed out, right? You have to look at that risk from an end to end view so that you're, um, really thinking through that in the business risk perspective. So the governance piece, um, there's uh, quite a few here. And the governance, by the way, is in the middle deliberately. That was a, a specific choice because in many ways it provides a bridge between the business and technology. It should not be a point of friction. Um, it should be a conduit and a channel that enables better um, conversation and discussion and process and rigor and not losing things. Um, but it is uh, very much a bridge function there. So the first thing, this is a little bit on the bold side, but governance needs to reduce complexity. It needs to help simplify. Um, a lot of governance uh, sometimes, uh, some, not a lot of governance, but frequently governance can increase complexity and add process for the sake of process. Um, and it's very important to make sure that governance is bold with simplifying things to make decisions easier 
for business folks that are making those decisions and and um, in which uh, decisions on which opportunities to pursue. I want to make that as simple as possible for them, for the security folks, for the IT people. Um, so the more that governance can encourage the reduction of complexity, the better, because complexity is truly the enemy of security. If complexity creates confusion, and confused people do not make good decisions. Um, and so governance must reduce complexity and, of course, the threat surface area and be continuously reducing that. Um, uh, next one, six, the governance frameworks should be guiding people, process, and technology. That language is uh, lifted directly from the original direct reform. Um, and with clear ownership of the decisions, the policy, and the aspirational vision. So governments should be helping guide people, make them help them make good decisions, clear decisions as fast as possible, so that they don't have to consider a whole bunch of factors. The, the more that you take the it depends out, the better. And you can do that through um, decision ownership of this person makes the call and they own the rest of one. You can do that with policy. This is the way we do things. We made this decision enough times that we know this is how we want to do it from now until we change the policy. And then aspirational visions can also help with that guidance for bringing that clarity. So the more that governance brings that clarity, the more that it can reduce complexity and make you more secure and more agile. Um, policies and security have to map directly to the organizational mission and risk. Security for security's sake is points. Security must be done for the purpose of organizational risk. Um, Without the business, there is no security. It doesn't matter. So you have to make sure you're aligned to that organizational mission risk. And as much as possible, favor that automated reporting because the metrics that you measure, if you have to do it manually, they're not going to get met. Uh, they're not going to get measured. They're not going to be measured correctly. So you want to make sure that's as easy as possible and that alignment is automated and connected to that organizational uh, mission. Then governance frameworks. Um, you know, governance needs to support shifting security close to the asset. Trying to do this as a big bulk network does not work. You have to get it as close to the asset as possible. Now you're going to need to group for efficiency. So, you know, all things of a certain type, all projects of a certain sensitivity. There's a lot of things you can do to create efficiencies in groups using that business lens, using technical lenses, but doing it with a big network doesn't work. And um, you wanna make sure it is as close to the asset as possible and the groupings that you do are then born of that knowledge of the asset as opposed to knowledge of the technical environment. Um, so you wanna shift the toolbox, uh, excuse me, shift the, the technical stuff to the toolbox to help and really focus on the assets themselves individually or as a common group of common attributes. And then nine, all assumptions of integrity and trust level must be explicitly validated to the degree possible. And this is really where the name of zero trust comes in, which is you have zero trust in something until you have explicitly validated that trustworthiness. And so the integrity and the trust level have to be explicitly validated. You cannot simply assume, oh, it's on the internet, it's fine. So that's one example. And then next we have technology and security controls. So security mechanisms must be simple, scalable, pervasive, and easy to manage. That may look familiar to some of you. That is exactly copy pasted from the original Jericho forum. That principle has not changed one iota. It was beautifully written, it was elegant. Simplicity is critical. Scalability, you cannot do something unless it's automated, et cetera, to be scalable, um, because it will not get done if it's not able to be scaled. It has to be pervasive. If everything works here, but oh, we forgot scenario nine and 10, then you're really not as secure as you should be. And of course, easy to manage. Because if it's not easy for the IT guy or gal, they're going to work around it. If it's not easy for the security person, they're going to work around it. If it's not easy for the business person, they're going to work around it. They have to get their job done. Their job is not necessarily to make all these other stakeholders happy that are within the org. Their job is to make money or get their job done. And so it has to be as easy as possible, simple as possible, scalable, pervasive, so that there's only one way to do it, and that way is easy. Uh, 11, access to systems and data must be granted only as required. This is another way of saying least privilege. So you say least privilege, the security person gets it, 
Got to explain it a little bit for folks that are outside of security, but pretty much systems and data have to be granted only required. And that is not just the traditional element because we've the, the traditional view of that has been, hey, I only want to put you in the certain groups. And we, we've heard in some of the previous sessions about the privileges accruing as someone becomes more senior because they never get taken out of groups, they just get added to the groups. And that is very true. And that is one very important element of this privilege. But we've also learned that there is sort of a one simple trick. Um, there's there's another approach that you can use to bring down your attack surface, which is to limit the time. So moving to a just in time, such as a privilege identity management, privilege access management. The more that you can provide the services and the privileges rather on demand as needed, you know, throw a little workflow on there for the, especially for the super important things, but that the, the, the privileges come on demand over time, even if they're a member of a lot of groups and they potentially have a lot of access, you've you've um, reduced it a lot if they have to ask for those permissions each time they use them, you know, within reason, you don't get too much in their job, um, and interrupt their job too much. But the more that you can do that, the more that you can keep those from being standing privileges and keep those from being standing risks, really. Um, and attackers would essentially have to advertise their intentions in order to get the privileges they want. They can't just silently use those. So we've learned that it's very important to look at these privileges through a number of different lenses, you know, including which privileges you're entitled to at some point or potentially entitled to, and then also uh, time bounding. So those two, that combination of the two, the just enough access, just in time access, tend to be a very powerful way of practically bringing you closer and closer to that least privilege um, nirvana. So next 12, all assumptions of integrity and trust must be explicitly validated to the degree possible. This sounds a little bit repetitive of the previous one. Um, we may take this out and maybe one of those that's bare repeating. These are almost final. Um, so these are getting really close. We'd love to have more participation. There are some uh, discussion in the chat window of you know, the different folks that can participate. We'd love to get more folks in that help finalize these. Um, but in this case, um, in this particular version that bears repeating, that all assumptions of integrity and trust must be explicitly validated to the degree possible. Um, there's uh, there's obviously this ongoing need to sort of instrument devices better, instrument um, users better, and bring in more data sources. So it's you know, easy for a normal user to do something, but it's very hard for an attacker to mimic that. So we need to have that kind of um, that that duality, and so that is going to be constantly improving. So expect this line to move forward, but to the degree possible by the technology available, we want to make sure that we are uh, making sure that the the integrity and trust level are explicitly valid, validated in all for all those different assets for all those different requesters and principles, um, so that they are um, uh, so that they are proven for the attack. And that brings us down to the technology section. So um, reinforcement, we had this at the, the higher level, the risk level of looking at the lifetime. We also want to look at this for the technology lifetime. Confidential and integrity must be maintained for the lifetime of the data, the transaction, the relationship. We want to make sure that, again, we're not protecting just that moment in time or just that portion of the transaction or just that one type of communication with the partner that we're looking at this overall and at the full life cycle. You know, what happens before, what happens after, look left, look right, as our soft likes to say. Um, and let's, look, let's take a look at the full life cycle of those and make sure that we have the controls in place, you know, from the beginning, through the middle, and all of its iterations, permutations, all the way to its end of life. That we are making sure that those assurances are there and it's not just, oh yeah, we forgot to protect that after we forgot about that. Um, so we wanna make sure we're very, um, intentional deliberate about that. 14, data centric, app centric must replace network centric. So network is not bad. It is not wrong, but it is, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So you wanna have network controls in place. You wanna have firewalls in place, but you cannot rely and bet your business on them. And you cannot make them the paradigm so much so that you interrupt business functionality. Um, so data centric and application centric those tend to be the stores of business value. Data is the intellectual property, the process is the other pieces there. Um, applications um, are often extremely valuable things, and when they go down, the business loses money. 
Um, so those tend to be the te technical instantiations of business stores of value. And so that must be the center of your thinking. It's very much a business centric thinking, but in most cases it lands on data or apps to provide the business value and you know, store. And so we need to make sure that we're looking at it through that lens as opposed to those network centric strategies. We have to look at the entire life cycle, the end use that flight and rest, and we need to reduce that threat service by Re, um, by eliminating and reducing data risk. Um, you know, mentioned tokenization specifically, and I think a little bit earlier I mentioned you either have to bring the data, uh, excuse me, bring the security up to meet the needs of the data, or you need to bring the data down to meet the um, security that is possible to provide. And of course, you know, the more that you can reduce problems you have to solve, the better. So if you can devalue, tokenize um, that data and make it something that's easy to secure, life is good you know take the one copy of the social security numbers or the other pni phi whatever it is put it in a highly secure database and give everybody else a generic pointer to that then you're in a much 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 better place because you have less databases you have to bring up to that highest level of standard so the more that you can apply that kind of thinking with that 15. um asset centric approach based on the asset sensitivity so this is very much recognizing that you need uh, very much uh, uh, related to the previous one, that the asset centric approach has to be driven there. And you gotta look at the sensitivity of it and perform prioritization of what you focus on first, next, and later by how much impact it has and what how sensitive it is to business. And then you gotta get that controls harmonization in place. So with that, oops, that's where we go. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the mappings to the Jericho form. So, um, broken down pretty much um, into two different slides because, quite frankly, we're in our room. We end up with about 14, 15 of these things. Um, you'll see that they are very, very closely related to the original Jericho form. One inspired quite a few, um, and uh, quite a few ended up uh, processing into you know, one, which is very much the whole of zero trust that. You know, work in any location, uh, any network, and the same security assurances. And so the, the linkages between these are quite extensive. The one that I will call out that uh, note here, and I think um, Steve uh, Whitlock mentioned earlier, um, devices and applications must communicate using open secure protocols. That is still very much a truth, but it is not really a part of the zero trust solution or architecture per se. And so we chose to, and, and quite frankly, the open ID OAuth and, um, and those kind of things ended up, that boat is pretty much sailed as far as the current generation of technology. And so I'd you know, like to think and hope that you know, the Jericho Forum and some of the early work of the, of the open uh, group has influenced that. Um, but ultimately, those things are out there and uh, running. And it's not something that, as an organization that is consuming this, that has a zero trust strategy and building it, it's not something that there's a huge amount of influence over. So we decided to, to de-emphasize that one and, uh, and not include it. But uh, for the most part, you'll see that these things are very uh, closely linked to the original Jericho form commandments. Um, you know, mutual trust levels, um, you know, it has to uh, work outside of your locus, your area of control, very much related to one as well as the lifetime piece because you know, time changes how much you can control. Um, Segregation of privileges, um, and then on the other page, we actually address uh, some of the other ones. So let me jump to the second page. And so, you know, um, again, here's that direct copy. Security must be simple, scalable, pervasive, and easy to manage. 100% direct copy paste. Um, and all of these things do link in. So you see 11 here. I was a little bit more of a technical control, security control. So it has to be secured in, uh, when stored in transit and in use, and that made its way into um, several. So uh, ultimately, you will see that there's a lot of commonality between these, and the, the zero trust core principles are very much an evolution of the thinking. Um, you know, again, for the modern day, a little bit more emphasis on business and governance, um, uh, but it's much more of a representation of what the security world needs as of this moment in time and as we anticipate them. So with that, I think I have used up my time, and I thank you very much. I look forward to questions in the panel session. Mark, thank you very much. Great job. And as you say, your your uh, questions are going to be in the panel session, but uh, 
uh, thank you for taking us through that through that project. And as as you said, you know these these principles are not quite published, not quite final, um, but uh, getting close to at this point. And uh, it would be great to get get more people involved. So uh, round of applause, virtual round of applause. Thank you for uh, for, for Mark Simos.